start the meeting. It is 6 p.m. Today is Wednesday, May 13th. This is the Upper Dublin School District uh, School Board Finance Committee meeting, and I will call the meeting to order. Uh, do we have any announcements, Mr. Luckman? I do not have any announcements. Thank you. We have minutes from our April 15th meeting. If anybody has any corrections to the minutes, please get them to Brooke and those will be moved forward to the legislative meeting. Uh, let's dive right into the finance reports and recommendations starting with the Sandy Run Middle School update. Uh, Bob, you want to kick that off? Bob, you're muted. Oh, okay. Uh, we have uh, Zach and Arif with us tonight, and they were going to go over a presentation of their reports of uh, the status of the project. Okay, go ahead, uh, Zach or Arif. I'm not sure which. No of problem at all. I will lead this. I'm going. Okay, there okay. we go. Uh, we'll s go right to the next slide, please, Brooke. Thank you. Bear with me a second. There we go. Okay, that's um, here we are with the phasing plan. I wanted to say the first thing: uh, the, um, the the building pad construction to be complete three twenty five that has been completed. Uh, the main building pad to be complete June first that has also been completed. So we are a little bit ahead on that main on that main building pad, which is a good thing at this point. Um, the foundation special excavation classroom wing to be complete on on five eight that has been completed and below the main building pad to complete june 24th um, those foundations are underway and it looks like that we should be able to also hit that milestone date we're, we're we, now that everybody's back we do have the same amount of people on site that we did on march 19th so that's a good thing and, and everybody's moving forward quite well you can go to the next slide, please, and we'll show some pictures of what's been happening. Those are the foundations, the reinforcing steel, the picture on the left, and then the gentleman placing uh, concrete on the right. That's actually going to be the new uh, foundations for the new gymnasium. So we're moving right along. Next slide, please, Brooke. This was a big milestone date. To the, on the left-hand side there, you can see the old existing meter pit. Um, we got that meter pit out and the new meter pit, which is on the right-hand side, um, installed last Wednesday. And if you can see on the right-hand side of the new meter pit, um, the, the line on the right is what's gonna feed the new building. The line that's sticking out with the cap on it on the left, that's your, uh, yep, that's there, that's the fire line that's gonna feed the, the fire water and the sprinkler system for, for the building. That curved piece that you see out of the straight sections with the two gentlemen down there working on it, that's actually just a temporary line that's feeding the existing middle school until the new school is built. Any questions on that guys, just ple please jump in. Um, next slide, please. So this is showing the construction milestone dates for the site work for the most part. Um, and you can see what we have completed there up to June 1st. So here again, we are a little bit ahead of where we need to be site wise, which is a good thing right now. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide and I'll spend some, I'll spend some time on that because that had to do with the, has to do with the building. So the, can you guys see the items there with the arrows or are the photos of each other covering it? I can see it. Everybody can see it. Okay, that's good. So the first one you can see that was, that, that was 325. That's been completed. The second item down there, um, we were to complete May 8th. Um, so we, we did miss that, but we are 95% of the way there. We, we would have made it not had the project gotten stopped. I feel confident that that's in, that that one is in a good place as well. The third one down there um, to complete on six one um, that's already been completed. So 
here again, we're a little bit ahead there. Um, the next one down to complete, we're on time. Um, looking at number 2B.5, place concrete slab on grade in the classroom wing. That was supposed to complete May 15th. Now we are 50% of the way there, and we do plan on finishing that, um, that milestone activity by the end of May. So only a little bit behind on that, and I do feel confident that we'll be able to make up a lot of this time as we move forward with the team we have out there. Um, the next one, 2B6, that's to complete on June 1st, and we're already about 70% of the way there. Yep, thank you. Um, next one down to complete July 31st, that's underway. Um, the masonry bearing construction for the, for the ground floor to complete May 6th, that's already complete. So here again, we're a little bit behind on one activity, but we're ahead on, on two others. So the erection of the structural steel, which is 70% complete, that's to finish May 22nd. We're already 70% of the way there. And here again, by the end of, by the end of May, that will complete. Um, the next one down is not till July 10th. That's 50% of the way. So here again, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we're going to make that milestone there. Um, but the big ones here really are the two that are at the bottom, um, right where the arrow. Yep, that's exactly right. The masonry uh, construction to complete. And then the one beneath that to get the building watertight. Arif's going to talk to you at the, at the end of the presentation about the schedule, which I'm sure is a, is a major concern. Um, but we have a full year to get that building watertight. And that's the big milestone right now that we're looking for is at 531-2021. We have that building watertight that gives all of the contractors opportunities to start to get things inside the building completed. So we're behind on one of these activities, as I explained, but we're a little bit ahead on, on some others. So I am, I am confident that we're gonna make up this time. Next slide, please. That was an overall site shot that was taken Monday. So you can see in the background, that's the classroom addition. Um, the first and, and the ground floor is completed and the masonry bearing walls for the first floor are actually gonna complete by the end of this week. Uh, if you look over in the background to the left, you can see the masonry bearing shell for, for area B. That's exactly right. Um, and we've already started structural steel since Monday. And then in the front of the picture, you can see uh, that's the, the foundations for the gymnasium right there. Yep. So you can see that, that the entire building pad is done. There's a little bit of backfill to happen, but I wanted to give you guys a, an, an overall um, shot of the site. So if we go to the next slide, you can see the overall site shot from a different angle. So there you see the classroom, which we're gonna consider area A and the structural steel is completed for that area and the masonry walls are complete on the ground floor as well as the first floor. And that, that those for the first floor, that'll complete this week. So we can go on to the next slide. We'll just show a couple of detailed photos. That's the planetarium retaining wall. And the, the picture on the left is when it was formed up and that was placed on March 19th, the day before the project got stopped. So since we've come back, those forms have been stripped and this picture is even a few days old, that area is now being backfilled. So that, that, that's all up to grade in that, in that planetarium area. So next slide, please, Brooke. Um, this is a picture of the retaining wall on the left and you can see the reinforcing steel that's there and the forms are about halfway across only on one side so in the, in the Behind that is what's going to be the courtyard and the classroom addition. So we are almost done with that entire retaining wall. That's going to probably finish in the next two to three weeks. And the photograph on the right is the last course of CMU going on the first floor of the classroom wing in area A. We can go to the next slide. And that's just a photo there. What I did want to express is a lot of things are happening behind the scenes coordination wise that we can't see by being in the field, but the entire three story areas A and B, which is shown in that rendering, um, all of the building um, information modeling has been completed and it's mostly completed for the entire first floor of areas C, D and E, which is your main, your, your main building area. So um, we are where we need to be 
as far as the coordination wise. So when install of, of ductwork and plumbing and piping starts, um, all that's already been coordinated. So we're good there. A couple more photos on the next slide. I wanted to show you, this is area A, the, the, the classroom wing, and you can see the contractors on the left-hand side, they're putting down their sleeves, they're rough in through the deck. And then on the, the photograph on the right-hand side is the completed first floor concrete slab that's been installed. And area, area B is gonna be complete by the end of this week. I'm sorry. Area B is gonna be complete by the end of May, is what we're shooting for. So we're, we are on target there. And just a couple pictures of what it looks like on the actual first floor. Um, if you look at the photograph on the left, that's your main corridor. You'll have classrooms on the right, you'll have classrooms on the left. And you can see the masonry walls going up and the scaffolding being installed on the, the, the photo on the right. So those are your classrooms. Next slide, please. Now this is the ground floor in area A, the classroom wing. I'm not sure why that photograph isn't loading on the left-hand side, but um, it's the same picture on the left and the right. One is before the concrete. So first the stone goes down, then that yellow plastic gets installed. That's what we call the vapor barrier. Over top of that goes the reinforcing mesh. And then what you see in the photograph on the right-hand side is the completed concrete slab on grade for that area. And Skepton is doing a wonderful job as they're supposed to be doing. They're what we call wet curing that concrete floor. So you see him with the hose there the day after it was poured, it's saw cut. And so they are following specifications to the T. And that area has been completed. Um, just one more photo, one more set of photographs there. Uh, this was just taken this morning, actually. Uh, the structural steel installers, the erection team is back. On the left-hand side, you can see that's area B. A couple of the photos earlier in the, in the presentation, there was no vertical steel there. So that's all been installed. And then on the picture on the right, you can see we're actually um, all those beams at the end of, of today, not only the upright columns, but the horizontal beams have been installed for area B of the classroom wing. And by the end of next week, we're hoping to have that completed inspection included. So we're ready for the next slide, please. And with that, I believe I'm going to turn this over to Arif. Thank you, Zach. Um, good evening, board members, members of the administration and public. Um, so Zach gave you a really good overview of the tremendous progress that's been made. And I want to start off by first mentioning that um, you know, obviously we had the work stoppage in March 20th, but we were back on site April 14th uh, was the first day we were back on site uh, setting up. And um, I think a big part of that um, has to be the team effort that was put forth between Andy Leckman, uh, Bob Lester, uh, Dr. Yanni, um, our team, and the contractors. And I really want to mention that because... Um, we were working uh, with numerous school districts on the processes and best ways to uh, get these projects back started. And um, unequivocally, the school district and your, your team here um, was very supportive and very cooperative. And, um, you know, we, we really came up with a lot of good ideas and, and mechanisms to do that. We also had help from uh, Justin O'Donohue uh, to make sure we were managing the district's risk as well. And we did some uh, pretty creative stuff to get everybody back on site. So that happened. And I think that's really why you see the tremendous progress that um, Zach just showed you. So I did, I did want to bring that up. And uh, that's going to, what we did there, I think, is really going to pay dividends, as you can see, moving forward. So a couple of things I wanted to mention. Number one, from a risk management standpoint, we are out of the ground and special excavations have been completed. And you guys all know the amount of effort we put into that and the strategies we came up with in the bid documents. And I wanna recognize that that has paid off and we are uh, mitigated one of those big risks. Um, uh, the annex building is down. Now we still have the main building to tear down and there's still some issues there 
liquid soil, so we can't rest yet, but um, a big portion of it is, is resolved. As Zach pointed out, the third bullet there, um, approximately 32 workers are on site daily in a coordinated effort and trying to keep everyone safe and working under um, conditions that nobody's uh, typically had to work with before. And um, everybody's been doing a great job and, and we're, uh, we, we think we're not missing a beat right now. So everything's really working well. The site is in stable condition. Um, we have not had any big issues or concerns. The ENS is working well. And as you're aware, we're very close to the uh, stream there. And we have to be very uh, conscientious about that. So everything's working well um, in that regard. So that's another positive. Um, the one bullet I want to point out here, the one under that uh, on the right side there, the second bullet, is, you know, there are a lot of still variables and unknowns that are out there. Although we're looking really good right now, um, the subcontractors, suppliers, vendors, you know, manufacturers, they're having backlogs or delays. I mean, I think everybody knows that. Um, all you have to do is look at the food stores, the supermarkets, the you know, deliveries of FedEx, UPS, whatever it is, everything is um, a little bit um, out of the norm. And um, so we are working very hard in that regard. Um, recently, the, the district has completed the color selections and approvals so that all of our submittals, we push really hard on that because I want to make sure all of our submittals are being put in line and procurement is unaffected um, or is you know, mitigated any issues relative to procurement and delivery of materials, because that, that could be an issue. So the entire team, again, has really been helping on that. And um, I think that's, that's been very helpful. Um, today's a beautiful day. We want more of these. So whoever on the school board's in charge of that, please uh, make that happen. And I think that'll clearly keep us um, on target. When I say on target, um, we have to remember our on target date, uh, Zach pointed out the 21 date to get the building uh, watertight, May of 21, but then May of 22 is our target date to finish the building. Um, and the reason we have that date is because we've got to transfer over from the modulars and do that and get ready over the summer. That summer of 2022 is going to be as feverish as the first summer was setting up the modulars. So um, that is to me our target date of 521 and then 522. Um, in terms of the actual ins and outs and nuts and bolts of the schedule, you'll have to give us a little more time because um, <clears throat> even as late of our meeting this week, we're working with all the contractors to update that schedule. As you recognize, people have just come back on site <clears throat> barely a month and we did lose a good five weeks, uh, almost five weeks we, we lost. Um, so we really need to look at the impact of that. But right now, we think on this project, we had enough um, <clears throat> flexibility and we got off to a great start that I think we are making up that time and we should be fine. So um, that's our report. Uh, Brooke, if you go to the last slide, it's simply questions, but maybe you can leave it right here and see if anybody has any questions or anything else we could add. Thank you. All right, thank you, Zach and Arif. Uh, any questions starting with the committee for Zach or Arif? I see nobody's hand up or from the rest of the board. Mike, go ahead. Hi, Arif. Um, I have a question. I, when we're looking at the procurement of materials, um, are there two or three um, specific uh, types of material that you see as high risk? And uh, if so, uh, what are the outside of uh, early approvals, what other mitigation uh, opportunities do you see? For example, multiple supply sources, um, uh, pulling procurement ahead, uh, things like that. So that's, that's a great question. And unfortunately, I don't have identified, uh, or fortunately, we have not yet identified anything that is a concern for our project at this time. So, um, so we're not aware of anything. Even 
uh, you know, something like the elevator. We pushed to get the elevator submittals moving so that we didn't have an issue with getting the, um, you know, pit for the elevator and some of the components so that we could get them into the ground as part of the foundation. So, so, so far we haven't seen that. The good news is all of the submittals that were necessary um, have been approved and with the color selection the last few will be so um, right now we don't have any targeted items and um, unfortunately when we identify them they're going to be if there is one they won't be as simple as just procuring an alternative material because I think um, with a public bid lump sum fixed price bid it's based on a certain vendor's pricing on bid day which is almost a year ago and so we really have to be careful. I think right now our, our job is to make sure we don't have any of them. If we do, um, I know we'll come up with a solution, but I don't really have a specific one right now to give you. Okay, so there's nothing specific, specific uh, keeping you and Zach up at night in terms of uh, a high risk material or anything like that, so. Correct, right now, no. Okay, thank you. All right, any, uh, any other? Questions or comments from the board? So naturally, uh, our our major concerns are schedule and budget. I feel like we got a pretty thorough update on schedule, and I'm sure you'll keep us apprised um, if something unforeseen does pop up. Um, is there any uh, anything to say, or when when might we have a better sense of the impact on budget from the shutdown? Uh, that's a great question again, Mark. Um, so, so far what we've identified, I, I would like to call incidental, Andy may correct me, but um, relative to our overall budget, um, some of the things we've had to do with the COVID-19 protocols to implement um, through a cooperative effort, I would call incidental. And I think we have more than adequate contingency to cover that. Um, Andy and I have um, agreed we need to go back and look at our budget, but the reality is I don't think at this point, Andy, I think you would agree that we're asking for any budget, direct budget impact to increase the overall number. We just need to um, look at some of our individual line items, uh, Mark. So we, we still need to do that, um, and uh, but I don't see any major issue. Great. Okay, um, also in this item on the agenda, we have the standard budget update uh, is there anything to call our attention to from either of you or from Andy on that? The only real thing, um, getting back to Arif's point, is I added a line item uh, related to COVID-19 impacts. Uh, so you'll see that added as a line item right now. There's a, a little under $29,000 added to that, that item related to our certified industrial hygienist, just the placeholder, um, and some additional services costs that were uh, we're working through with um, with Arif uh, and his team. So um, that's a line item that will continue to break out separately. I felt it was important to have set costs associated with this um, separately. Um, and if we have any further, we'll, we'll start to talk through that. But yes, I agree with Arif that he and I need to spend some time going through the budget um, and, and making necessary updates at this point. All right, are we likely to see that update next month or when, when, do, you, when, when do you think we'll have that? That's reasonable, Andy, I think. Yep, I agree. Okay, great. Uh, Art, you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, Arif or Zach or Andy, when we move to green, will we continue these additional uh, safety requirements? So that's, yeah, so Art, that's a great, great question also. And, uh, um, I honestly don't know the answer. All I can tell you is right now what I'm generally targeting is a week after June 4th, if everything is in order, I think that's when we're going to be talking with uh, Bob, Andy, the contractors, and talk about what protocols we start to alleviate. Probably not all of them, but maybe a few of them. And, um, but again, I think it's premature to reach that conclusion right now and give you a date, whether green would mean nothing is needed or not, because who knows, you know, every 
I mean, I'll be honest with you, when from the time we started and Andy and Bob know this is it's been like every and Zach, every other day we were getting new information every week, we're getting new stuff. So um, I think it would not be fair to, to make a prediction at this point, Art, but my goal is after Ju a week after June 4th to really look at what do we need to be doing with everybody. Is that fair? And June 4th is the stay home order date, right? Yeah. All right. Anyone else have anything for Arif or Zach? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, both of you, for the update. Uh, it's good to see uh, all the good progress we have and that it seems like the shutdown has not been uh, terribly painful, at least so far, for us. Um, so uh, looking forward to continued progress. Um, if uh, you guys are obviously, as always, welcome to hang out, but we understand perfectly if you have other things you'd prefer to be doing. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank right. you. Okay, so long, Arif. Bye-bye. All, right. All right, so um, we've covered the Sandy Run Middle School update uh, up to the Fort Washington roof repair change order, Bob. Uh, yes, change order number one for the Fort Washington roof repair. Um, that's really a closeout change order. Uh, uh, it's, we're seeing credit. We're coming in a little under budget on that. Uh, the original budget for this project was $152,400. Built into that was a $24,000 allowance for uh, perimeter roof repairs. Uh, it was a condition that they weren't going to know until it was cut open, how much repair was going to be needed, uh, how bad the fix was going to be. So we did have money in the job for that. Uh, so this change order, we had $24,000 to work with. This change order is for $17,674.74. Uh, included in that is the permanent repair and also a $3,700 credit for materials. Uh, Carlisle was going to come to the table with us uh, for materials. We expected more, uh, but they're caught in uh, this financial situation as well right now. So we're really just looking at a a $3,700 credit and they want to work with us on any future projects. Um, so in all, this job came in uh, $6,325.26 under budget. Uh, so change order number one is for the $17,674. Uh, total project cost will be $146,074. All right, comments or questions, uh, Art? Just confirming that they are, they left the site. Are we done? Yeah, they are finished. They did come back to work uh, during um, during the, the COVID work shutdown. Uh, we um, consider this an essential job. Uh, they came back. It took a little bit. They had to work with their insurance company to make sure they were doing all the proper things for their own employees. Uh, they installed their own wash station. They had a separate um, porta potty for just their employees only that they maintained. Uh, they had a lot of safety requirements that, uh, that they met. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we felt this credit adjustment uh, for change order number one was fair because the, the last portion of the work took a lot longer than anybody expected uh, just because of the safety measures that they had to uh, put in place. But uh, they are finished. We're waiting for our final inspection from Carlisle Roofing. Uh, they, they need to come out and do their final inspection so our warranty can be continued. And when are we expecting that to happen? Uh, any day now. Uh, we're going to hear back. It may have happened this afternoon. I didn't hear, uh, but I do expect it by Friday. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All right. Any members of the committee uh, opposed to moving this forward? All right. So we'll move that forward to the legislative meeting. Thanks, Bob. Next up is uh, E-Rate Application Services Agreement. Is that Andy? So, Brooke, can, can you please um, bring Phil in? Uh, Phil's going to cover the next three items. Hello, everybody. Um, 
Yeah, so the, this first item is our E-rate e -rate application. Uh, we partner with the MCIU uh, to do uh, the heavy lifting of that application work um, for both our category one, which is essentially our internet services, and then our category two, which is our infrastructure. Okay, any comments or questions? All right, anyone opposed to moving that one forward? All right, that's an easy one. We'll move that forward to the legislative and jump up to the internet service contract. All right, that, that's part two, annual renewal of our internet uh, service contract. So the um, IU is also our internet service provider and they manage our regional wide area network as well. Um, they provide the service um, at a great cost for uh, most of the participating IUs. Uh, I mean, uh, school districts. All right, comments or questions on that? Phil, is that uh, same bandwidth as last year? Yeah, so we're gonna do the same bandwidth again. Uh, we're at one gig right now, um, and we, we're never hitting our cap even with everybody in school. Um, so we have completed our backbone so that we're really able to dial that up. Um, and. Uh, we can pivot to dial that up at any point in time. So we have flexibility to uh, adjust both with Crown Castle from whom we lease our fiber and with the IU. Um, and it's really a minimal cost uh, to increase, to jump from one gig to 10 gig, um, but it would have no measurable impact right now. It's only really if you're consistently uh, hitting your ceiling that you wanna do that. And right now we're not hitting the ceiling at all. Yeah. Uh, is there an opportunity to, to um, do a shorter term plan and, and buy less bandwidth until we we're actually able to reopen? Uh, this is the minimum. So okay. you're buying in at, at really the minimum. All right. And, uh, and how's the dollar amount compared to past years? Oh, it's fantastic. Like every year, I mean, right now it's stable, uh, but the IU really brought it down uh, from what we were paying before. Um, but, and before we weren't working directly with the IU. So moving to the IU and then the IU has bundled into its regional wide area network cost uh, a one gig. So we're really not paying any more. Uh, we used to pay more for both the RWAN and the internet service, but now we're really just paying for the RWAN and then we get the one gig bundled as part of that. Yeah, fantastic. All right, other comments or questions? All right, anyone opposed to moving that forward to the legislative meeting? Okay, we'll move that forward and let's head on to the VMware renewal. So this is just a software renewal for our virtual servers. Uh, last month we approved the service contracts on those servers. So that's the you know, 24 seven uh, response. And this is just the actual software. All right, comments or questions? All right, anyone opposed to moving that forward? All right, we'll move that one forward to the legislative meeting as well. Thanks, Phil. Okay. And we're up to treasurer's reports. Andy, anything to call our attention to here? Mark, Mark on treasurer's reports or budgetary transfers, I do not have anything specific to call your attention to tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments or questions from the board on treasurer's reports or budgetary transfers while we're here? All right, anyone opposed to moving both of those forward? All right, we'll move those forward to the legislative. And now we get into the fun stuff, budget estimates, Andy. Yeah, so thank you. I'm gonna, the presentation that I, I shared out and is part of actually the next agenda item. Um, so Brooke, if you could, if you could bring up that presentation, that's where I'm gonna start from. Um, what I'm going to cover tonight um, is two separate things throughout this presentation. I'm going to give the board an update on where we are currently in 2019-20 fiscal year um, and estimates of where we expect to end this fiscal year. Um, we'll take a pause, answer some questions, and then I'll transition into the, the 2021 proposed final budget update. Um, so slide two is where I'll start, Brooke. Um, one thing I just want to make sure uh, and make sure everyone understands the caution sign is um, it's very important to remember that um, these are just projections at this point. So 
So um, we'll have still have actual results for the month of May, the month of June, and some of that will spill over in, into July for revenues received for, for June. Um, so we've still got quite a bit of, of the year um, to, to show as actual. So um, the estimates that I'm talking about tonight will change um, and we'll continue, I'll continue to provide updates um, at future meetings. Next slide, Brooke. Um, so looking at the variance column on, on this slide, um, the early estimates, what they're showing are, um, we're expecting to receive about 777,000 less in revenue than what we budgeted. And I'll talk more about that. Um, we're also expecting $3.4 million less in expenditures than budgeted. And we're projecting a slight budget surplus of $764,000 compared to a budget deficit um, of a little over $1.8 million. Uh, one of the things we've talked about is the transfer to the capital reserve. And my recommendation is going to continue to be that we do not make any transfer to the capital reserve this year, even though we have a budget to do that um, due to the current financial crisis, um, which I'm going to talk, we'll talk about plenty tonight. Um, so our projected ending unassigned fund balance is $6.9 million. Next slide, Brooke. So this graph shows you the past and future revenue and expense trends in a chart. Um, and I want to continue to express again, while, while what I just shared with you is um, under budget, um, we're projecting a slight surplus. Um, school district budgets um, force us to take a conservative estimate. Um, and then we typically finish better than what the budget um, lays out. But if you look specifically at that orange line, which is our revenue, the actual 16, 17 through 18, 19, our estimate for 1920, what you are seeing here is that surplus is continuously shrinking year after year. Um, and the budget deficits going out into the future are growing away from each other. So again, I, I hear constantly, I've heard it my whole career in school district, well, you always finish better than what your budget plan is. Yes, that's true, um, but the trend that we're seeing here is not a great trend. Um, and we'll continue to, to see trends, I think, um, trend in the wrong direction, especially as we talk into the 2021 budget. Um, next slide, Brooke. So slide five shows you a detailed view of the local tax revenue projections through the end of the year. And I think as, as we look at 1920 and 2021, this is really the area of the, where the largest unknowns exist um, as, a, as a result of COVID-19. Um, we still don't have enough data to understand how these revenue sources are gonna be impacted. Um, it's too soon. The crisis happened too fast and nobody really knows what the, what the recovery time looks like. Um, and I think it's important to note that um, prior to the crisis, all of these revenue sources were trending better than budget, um, but we do expect them all to, to finish um, worse than, than what budget is showing. Next slide, Brooke. So slide six covers EIT trends. Um, and I thought this was a, a, a nice slide to start to see um, trends of, of EIT receipts by month over the last four years. Um, and the pink arrow shows you that we're already starting to see a drop off in, in April. Um, so we collected about $140,000 in EIT in April compared to last year, we collected about $250,000 in, in EIT. Um, and then last year, we also collected about 1.6 million in EIT during May and June, um, which are our largest collection months throughout the year combined. Um, so this year, there's two complicating factors here um, where we, you know, the, the estimates are really unknown. We don't know what the unemployment rate is, so we don't know what the true rate of, of lost EIT revenue is going to be. Um, and there's also the issue of the delay in tax filing to July 15th. So, you know, all of these filings that would have been happening that would have been causing all this revenue to be coming in for EIT, um, it's unknown what's actually happening on the filing side. Um, and while that money will eventually come in um, for this quarter, um, it will most likely be delayed until the July or August time frame. Uh, next slide, Brooke. So the other area um, of impact we believe will be transfer tax. Um, and transfer tax, again, is generated off of the sale uh, of real estate. Um, and what I tried to show you here was just that April, again, we see a slight drop off. Um, but February and March were actually very strong for us. Um, and I think that's, that's good news, but we can't really count on that. I mean, it's strong because we saw 
um, two large properties sell in February, and we saw um, another large property sell in March, which I noticed here. So again, good for, um, good for us this year, um, but we do expect that to continue to drop off uh, as uh, real estate, the real estate market slows down. Next slide, Brooke. So the next slide shows expenditure projections just at its highest level. Um, so we're projecting to end the year about $4.8 million under budget. Um, but again, almost $1.5 million of that is due to the, the delay in the capital reserve transfer, if at all. So you know, the remainder of that is about $2.1 million that is going to, um, going to be under, or $3.8 million, which will be under budget. Um, Brooke, slide nine shows a little more of the details. So um, this slide shows the detail behind the main, remaining $3.3 million in budget savings. Um, I have noted on the slide where COVID-19 shutdown has generated savings because in some cases, I think it's fair to say that it, it has. Um, but there's very little, very little savings have resulted from the shutdown, especially in salaries and benefits. Um, so we talked about Act 13 at the last meeting. Um, the state legislature passed Act 13, which mandated that all school districts continue to provide no more, no less compensation to all school district employees. Um, and, and that, so we're continuing to pay employees, um, but on the overtime side, as an example, um, we don't have overtime now for, for um, use of our facilities um, or, or additional transportation items that, that may have been happening like field trips and things like that. So there's definitely some savings from, from the budget side. Um, on salaries, I also note that every year there appears to be a savings in the, in the professional line item due to personnel leaves and turnovers. Um, so just to, just to cover that for a second and give an example, um, we know what our staffing is gonna be on, on every given, any given year. And what we budget for is the full contract amount for all staff that have a contracted position um, for that year. Uh, what inevitably happens year after year, um, but can't be planned for, is you have a teacher, teacher A goes out on, um, let's say maternity leave as an example. Um, teacher A is at the top of the scale making $100,000 um, and then goes out on an unpaid maternity leave. Well, we bring in a long-term sub to fill that position and let's just say that comes in at $50,000. You have just on the salary side of $50,000 savings plus payroll taxes that go along with that. So every year due to those types of leaves, which we have on a regular basis, um, we have savings, but it's not safe um, or prudent in my uh, opinion to budget any plan that leaves that we don't know about. I mean, that's totally outside of our control. Um, so every year that does generate a bit of savings. Um, on the benefit side, the big savings item there is workers' compensation. So we participate in a consortium of school districts with a company called SDIC. Um, and SDIC is a company that is in a very strong financial position and has been giving rebates on an annual basis. And I, I think the past plan was to budget sort of at our, what our cost would be without the rebates. Um, I, we feel very confident that SDIC is in no risk of losing those rebates for the next three years. Um, so we actually have that built in, that lower rate built in for next year. The rates are already set for next year. There's no risk, but there, that's actually built into our long range um, forecast as well. So we've started the budget at more realistic actual numbers in many cases. So that, that, that reduction is in our budget for next year. Um, and then just in general, COVID-19, we're seeing COVID-19 and our needs-based purchasing really being mindful um, about what we're purchasing, why we're purchasing it. You know, we do have savings in areas of subservices. Right now, we don't need substitutes for our teachers in the model that we're using to teach kids. Um, building repairs, general supplies, utilities, capital equipment, all these things, we're just, we're being smarter about what we're buying and we just don't need as much of it right now. Um, so there's, there's some savings there. So that's just a quick update on where we are in 2019-20. So I'll, I'll just stop there and see if there's any questions on that before we move into the, the 2021 budget. All right, comments or questions on the current year budget? Nobody? Okay, let's move on to next year, Andy. Okay, so the other big piece of what I need to cover tonight is uh, give you an update and, and talk to you about the proposed final budget for the 2020-2021 year. 
Um, I'm going to walk through the presentation and cover the highlights. Um, there's a lot of information in this presentation, so um, I want to suggest breaking it down into two sections and stopping um, on each. So I'm going to cover a recap and talk about revenue and then stop for questions. And then I'll cover expenditures and some comparisons that I have in um, and open it up for questions there. Um, I also want to note that um, I won't be going through it tonight, but I suggest everyone um, take, a, take some time and read it if they haven't already. There's a, there's a whole narrative document that I've included in the agenda. Um, that includes a, a, a wealth of information about our budget and our financial situation. So it's there, take it. Um, if there's any questions, I'll certainly address those, but I do not plan to walk through that document tonight. I just wanna cover um, the presentation. So slide one um, is uh, just a caution that I wanna give everyone. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell everyone, but we're in unprecedented times as a result of COVID-19. Um, and the annual budget process, um, if there's anyone new listening tonight, is a nine to 10 month process that requires detailed planning, um, collaboration, communication, and it begins to take its final form around April as we begin to plan the final budget. Um, as we were in the final steps of the process, we faced the most rapid negative economic impact that has ever been seen before. Um, known factors, past trends, um, they're no longer applicable in our current reality and major local revenue sources are projected to be hit the hardest. Um, I heard an interesting quote today, um, if anyone reviews the PSBA, um, Nathan Maines does some interviews on a daily basis. He had Dr. Wayne McCullough from PASBO on today. Um, and, and Dr. McCullough said, don't outrun yourself. He said, take your time, look at it in the short term right now, um, and then go from there. So long-term forecasts, uh, while they're important, and I continue to feel they're important for us to understand them, um, they're extremely unreliable right now um, for a wealth of reasons that we'll talk about. Um, and he suggested being conservative in your estimates because there's so many unknowns at this point. So understanding the long-term trends remain important, um, but right now we're focused on how we work our way through the current financial crisis facing school districts um, across the state and across the country. Um, but with that said, we have our Act 1 timeline that's set by the state and it requires that a proposed final budget be reviewed and approved at least 30 days before the board passes the final budget. Um, so that's what we're doing tonight. Slide 2, uh, so this is the recap, Brooke, here. Stay on this slide. Um, so I want to give a little recap on where we've been because I think it's important. Um, if, if you don't remember, the 1920 budget included a 3.3 million budgeted deficit. Um, we started the 2021 budget process from a negative financial position with a $2.8 million budgeted deficit. Um, so our goal this year was to do everything possible to bring budgeted expenditures back in line with budgeted revenues um, without impacting educational programming for students through a needs-based budget philosophy. Um, and, and while some of the numbers you'll see tonight look um, a little scary, um, I think we've succeeded in that. Um, if we were presenting a budget to you today without the impact of COVID-19, the budget would be balanced with no reduction in programming or material increase in class sizes. So we would have a balanced budget. Um, unfortunately, the current version of the budget has a $4 million structural deficit, primarily as a result of the impacts of local revenues. Next slide, Brooke. So this is the proposed sorry, final budget can summary. Can in there? Andy, can I just- Yeah, sure, Steve, go ahead. I just want to be to be clear when Andy said we would be um, giving or presenting a balanced budget with no material um, program cuts or uh, class size increases. The budget that we have right now doesn't do that either. Um, as we said in our communication that went out from the district earlier this week, we're committed to maintain, maintaining our class sizes within our class size caps and programs for kids. So you won't see classes um, that are, that are um, fundamentally over the cap and we're not looking at program uh, cuts at this time. So this slide gives you a high level view of the preliminary budget as compared to the proposed final budget. Um, we have revenues of a little over 100 million. We have expenditures of a little over 104 million. Um, and we have a def the deficit here shows about four, um, four million dollars. Um, so our ending unassigned fund balance in the proposed final is about $2.9 million. So slide, Brooke, next slide, and we'll cover some of the details. 
So about $80 million of our total revenue is from local sources. Um, so when we talk about COVID-19 and the impact of local revenues, um, that's our largest source of revenue for the district. A little under 20 million comes from state sources. And as you can see there, federal barely registers on this slide when compared to other revenues. So almost nothing there. Um, next slide, Brooke. So this is a high level summary just showing you, um, and again, we've looked at this slide before, but that personnel makes up about 76% of our budget, that's uh, salary, wages and benefits. Debt service makes up another 12% of our budget and then all others are remaining 12. Um, I like to point out here that all other is about $13 million and it doesn't mean discretionary. So you can see all the items that falls under the, the all other there and, and most of them are required items that we have um, we have some control over, but, um, but they're not truly discretionary where we can just go there and, and figure out our deficit in those areas. Next slide, Brooke. So here's your multi-year projections. And again, even though I began by talking about focusing on the short term, um, it remains essential to financially plan with a three to five year time horizon in mind. Um, the decisions that we're making this year will have an impact for years to come. Um, so you can see our budget, our projected deficit this year, um, the deficit line item is almost $4 million. That grows to over $5 million um, in the 21-22 year and almost $6.5 million in the 22-23 um, year. Um, the projections, just to be clear, um, do not include a recovery period. Um, so right now, you know, when you look at COVID-19 and the economic impact on that, nobody knows what the recovery period is going to look like. So um, you may be able to look at this as a worst case scenario, um, but will it be a V-shaped recovery? Will it be a U-shaped recovery um, or some other path? We don't know that. Um, there's also no new developments built into these projections. So we certainly know there's development happening um, in Upper Dublin Township uh, that will have positive impacts to these numbers. It will not close the deficit. It will not solve our problems, um, and, but they're out there. They will make the picture better as they become reality. Um, the other important to note there, a school district cannot legally pass a budget with a negative ending fund balance. So when you look at the 2021 projection, um, that, that can't be how we, how we approve a budget next year. That has to be at least um, zero and balanced. So slide seven is um, just to look at the prior assumptions that went into our budget. So I felt it important to just have that as a reference point. Um, the next slide is really the most important one to talk about what were the, what was updated now. So we know what our assumptions were, what changed. Um, we, uh, um, business administrators have been working with PASBO, which is our business, uh, our state organization that assists school districts and provides supports and reference materials. Um, we've been working very closely with PASBO. PASBO has done a lot of work around um, historical trends, um, what the last recession looked like to help put some meaning around um, how school districts can begin to put a budget together this year. Um, these really are based on our best guess around what might happen. Nobody truly knows. Um, but what's built in, so property tax revenue, we have a 2.6% tax increase built into the budget. Um, we had a 97% collection rate and we reduced it to 95.3%. And where 95.3 comes from is, 97% um, is a conservative budget collection rate. We typically collect a little better at about 97.3. Um, so the reduction I built in was off of more what our actual collection rate is versus what our budget it was. It felt like too much to go all the way down to 95%. Um, interim property taxes are expected to reduce by about half. So interim pro interims are based on um, you know, changes to real estate during the year in which taxes are collected. So if a new house is settled after tax bills are put out, um, you have an interim tax. If someone doesn't um, work on their home, that increases the assessed value of their property, uh, interim bills come out. So we're expecting that to reduce by about 50%. Earned income taxes based on employment um, and wages. So we're looking at a 17.5% reduction there from the 1920 budget. Um, and we're looking at delinquent property taxes reduced by 35%. We already had the interest income reduction built into the, the April version of the budget that we talked to you about. So next slide, bro. Um, local impact due to COVID-19. So this slide shows you based on all those updated assumptions I just talked about what the impact to the budget actually is. 
Um, and just to be clear, these are potential budgeted reductions. Actual results will absolutely vary from this. Um, but this is best, you know, as best as we can build this out right now. And you can see here the total impact from lost local revenue is almost $3.9 million estimated. Um, next slide, Brooke. So this graph was reviewed in 1920 estimates, but what I included in here was a gray line, just so you can see pre-COVID-19, what it looked like versus post-COVID-19 um, and the impact of the budget now has a $4 million structural deficit as compared to what would have been a balanced budget. So again, it just gives you another view of, of what's actually happening here. Uh, next slide, Brooke. So on fund balance projections, so this just looks at now that we know what the, what the deficits look like, what's actually happening to the unassigned portion of our fund balance. Um, the orange line looks at pre-COVID-19. So, you know, when we look at the orange line, um, you know, my big thing here when we're trying to balance budgets is, you know, how much runway do we have to really balance our budget? The orange line gave us three years to, to start to balance our budget. In the, in the out years um, as we start to project out. The blue line's really showing a negative fund balance as soon as the 2021 budget year that we need to, that we need to figure out. So it's just important for us to have that, um, have that sense of where we're at as far as fund balance. Next slide, Brooke. Now again, this is unassigned fund balance. We also um, have other areas of our budget that we have, we have sources of funds available um, I call them options of last resort. So due to the severity of the financial projections, it's important to know that um, I don't believe that our district is on an immediate path to running out of money. I just wanna make sure that's clear um, for the board and anyone listening. Um, I think the district has done an outstanding job of setting money aside for specific purposes, which does create the potential for needed flexibility only if needed, last resort. Um, so where do those funds exist? We have committed fund balance that the board has set funds aside for healthcare stabilization and property tax assessment appeals totaling around $3.6 million. Again, we, the board has committed those funds, set them aside for only those purposes. And in order to access those funds for something different, the board would need to take action to uncommit. Um, so I'm not suggesting to do that, um, but it's an option of last resort if needed. The district has also done a really good job of, of setting funds aside in other funds like a capital reserve fund. Um, we have a little over $6 million there. Um, but again, it's important to know that capital reserve fund is there to keep and maintain our um, facilities across the district um, in good repair. Um, so we have about $250 million worth of building and equipment assets to maintain. And this is a funding source that allows us to be able to access that um, a capital reserve fund could be used to make debt service payments, but only as a last resort. Um, the debt service fund is also there. We have about $4.5 million in a debt service fund, um, which again, seems like a lot of money, but the debt service fund is there to, you know, to repay um, debt service in the future. Um, but right now that only is about 35% of our 2021 estimated debt service payments. So, it's there, it's an option, but it's a, it's a funding of last resort. That funding is also important as we look to finish Sandy Run Middle School. Um, we need to go out and do two more issues of debt. We need to have a credit rating to do that. Um, and those funds help keep our credit rating unchanged. If our credit rating would start to decline as a result of the financial situation, um, we would pay higher interest rates, which would further exacerbate the issue that we're, we're trying to resolve here. Next slide, Brooke. So um, the next slide, um, these are the same slides. The next two slides are the same slides that I shared um, in April. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time walking back through these. The only other thing I wanted to mention here is um, we talked about having a 2.6% tax increase in the budget. Um, that means to, uh, based on the median assessed value home in the district, assessed value, $197,000. This is an annual increase of about $188. So each 1% increase is an annual increase of about $79. Next slide, Brooke. And um, two more slides, three more slides after this, and then we'll take a break. Um, so revenue assessed value, again, this is how I got to the total assessed value that, that builds out the property tax 
um, side of the budget. So if there's any questions, I'll answer that later, but I won't go through that. Um, slide 15, the next slide is a state budget impact. Um, so I think it's important to talk about this quickly. The state budget is just as uncertain as school district budgets are. So the state's currently discussing, um, last I heard, a half year budget, which would make our job of passing an annual budget that much more difficult. Um, I'm not even really sure what a half year budget looks like, but it's, um, it, it doesn't help us figure out what our revenue sources from the state could be or will be um, as in an, on an annual basis next year. Um, my approach here was just to assume a flat amount to the 1920 projections um, and then go from there as we get more information from the state. On the legislative side of the table, though, I want to point out that, um, you know, the state has been kicking around things like mandating that all school districts freeze property taxes in 1920. Um, and if you think about it, that would have, um, while I understand, you know, the financial crisis is not just for school districts, um, you know, that would mean another $2 million of lost revenue for the school district if, if property taxes were frozen at 1920 rates, raising our already $4 million deficit to uh, about $6 million. Um, there's also tax collection mandates that are being discussed um, by the state legislature, um, like an extension of the discount period um, or an elimination of the penalty period. Um, which could be put into place. So, if, you know, we generate about $55,000 due to um, property tax payments that are paid in the penalty period. Um, so that would be lost revenue. But, you know, th those are areas where the, you know, we could, um, some relief could be provided to, to taxpayers. Um, the CARES funding is also something just to note. Um, so the state applied and actually just today was approved to receive federal funding, um, which will help uh, helps states and school districts across the country. Um, the, the flow of funds will go to the state and then to school districts. All school districts will apply for this. Um, what we don't know yet is what that actual funding will look like. Um, so will it, be, will it be new additional money to school districts or will the state reduce their, you know, their share to school districts and fill it in with that CARES funding? So there's a lot that's still unknown um, there is no funding built into the budget right now for the CARES funding, and if we learn more information about that, we'll certainly build that into uh, to the, the final budget documents. Um, and then the last slide I want to cover before I, I stop, um, and again, this is the same slide from last time, um, but it's just a, an update of our state and federal revenue assumptions, um, and they're unchanged from April. So why don't I stop there, take a breath, um, and see if anyone has any questions on the, the revenue side of the proposed final budget. All right, Amy, I see your hand is up. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Andy. This isn't so much about the information as much as it is. Um, it might be useful to members of the community and even to the board on where some of the data is coming from in terms of how regularly you're meeting with colleagues across the state, hearing from the state, hearing from the legislators, because um, I, you've emphasized it a number of times, the uncertainty, and I just think it might be helpful to make folks aware of why things are changing so much constantly and where, where some of the information is coming from. Well, so, so we're getting regular updates, like I said, from, from PASBO. So PASBO is a regular source of information. Um, you know, there's information that PASBO puts out on a daily basis to keep us updated on, on what's going on and if there's new information available to us. Um, as far as colleagues, our Montgomery County um, business administrator colleagues meet on a weekly basis to talk and, and see what's going on in other districts, what they're hearing, do they have new information. Um, so on a daily and weekly basis, we're talking about what's going on. Um, the revenue trends, I mean, really, it's truly working with, um, with PASBO and other colleagues is, what are we hearing? What's the best information available? And right now, it's, it's little to no information that's available other than going all the way back to 2008 and seeing what the last recession looked like. And, but again, with that said, nobody knows how this, this crisis, how it compares to the, the last recession that occurred. So, so I think that's why we're just talking on a regular daily, weekly basis to, to understand um, what new information is out there. And PASBO for the audience is uh, the, the Pennsylvania Association of School Business Officials. So it's, it's a statewide organization that supports school districts specifically from a business and operations standpoint. 
Stan. Yes, um, Andy, do you see any um, revenue impact of either positive or negative with uh, residents working from home where they would have either worked in Center City or another state or another township? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we know the answer to that yet, Stan. Um, again, we, we do, so um, we do receive some uh, EIT funds back from Philadelphia. Philadelphia gets to keep all that EIT up front, and then there's a Sterling Act um, process where we do get some of that revenue back at, at the end of the year that we submit. Um, but no, that's one of the areas that nobody really knows, um, nobody knows the impact yet as, as a result of people working from home. Okay, teach you. Um, Andy, just to clarify, if uh, payments are made on income tax or otherwise after um, July 1st, does that still go to the, the budget, uh, to, the call, to the revenue for this year or does it automatically go then? So, so we, we don't get a breakdown from our, our tax collector. Um, and Jen, you can certainly feel free to jump in here, but I, I believe that none of that would, would um, go back to the prior year because we don't know when, when, when um, our, our tax collector sends us a payment, we get $10,000. We have no idea what that $10,000 is associated with. Is it associated with the tax return from last year? Is it a you know, delinquent from a prior year, or is it a, a current month payment? So we book the revenue um, in the month that it's received. So any any earned income tax received in July would all just get booked in July. So Jen, please, please correct me. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, that that's correct. The only part that we can accrue back to the current to last year would be any revenue we receive. It's most likely that first week in July. Is it stated from Berkheimer 628, but we don't receive it in our bank until like July 2nd or depending on the holiday. That's the only piece that can be accrued back to the previous year. Everything else after that point would be current year revenue posted to, to uh, 2021. Darlene, you've got your hand up. You may be muted if you're trying to talk. Um, Andy, do you have any sense of um, unemployment numbers in our township and when we might get them? No, we, we don't know that. Um, we have a contact at the unemployment office um, who we've been told uh, is starting to gather that data. Um, so again, that's another data point that as soon as we start getting real information, um, from the unemployment office, we can certainly share that back, um, but, but I don't have that at this moment in time. Jen? Um, this is very thorough. I, I'm wondering, I'm looking at, you have charts about the uh, earned income tax trends and uh, also the transfer tax. Do you, like percentage wise, do you know what it has, was down last month? Like I can see you, you made the chart where it goes down in April. It so, probably so, so in April it was down, I want to say about, about say 45%, right? Okay. So, you know, okay. we received 250,000 last April. We received 140,000 this April. Okay. Um, but and again, then, but ahead. again, on, the, on that, Jen, just to make sure, like, we, again, I don't know how much of that is related to lost wages and unemployment or people delayed filing their taxes until July, right? That, that's the hard thing to understand right now. So I don't think it's 45% unemployment rate, which is why we've only built about 17 and a half reduction in the next year's budget. Okay. And the transfer tax, do you, like a percentage wise there? On, on what the reduction was? Yeah. And April. I mean, you have a lot of facts there. I just was trying to get my mind around it. So it's fine. Yeah, I mean, transfer tax, I mean, what, may, maybe about 25% if I had to estimate a 25% okay. reduction. Thank you. Yep. All right, any other comments or questions on the revenue side? 
All right, let's keep moving, Andy. All right, Brooke, next slide. So um, on the expenditure side, this first slide compares the expenditure changes to the 1920 budget. And again, these are very similar formats to what you saw um, last month when we talked about this in April. Um, overall, the total expenditure budget has decreased by about $694,000 as compared to the 2019-20 budget. The only real major material changes on the expenditure side that we've made from April um, is by uh, putting in or building in the full impact of all retirements and re res resignations. Um, so that's all built in there. So you can actually see the salary portion of the budget there um, is basically flat year over year. Um, we've had 10 retirees uh, and we only plan at this point, the only plan is to replace three of them. Um, so that's where we're generating about $1.4 million in total compensation savings um, from that reduction. Um, and again, you know, you, you look back to how our expenditures are broken down, 76% of our budget is, is personnel related, as are all school districts pretty much. We're all personnel driven. Um, so that's, you know, that's where a large portion of the, the savings can come from, from things like retirements and, and right, -sizing, right sizing the district. Um, so, uh, on uh, as you scroll down here, um, the over yeah we talked about that. Brooke, actually, next slide. So overall, we've been able to achieve over a two point nine million dollars in an expenditure reduction since the preliminary budget in December, which is what what this compares. Um, and again, you can see most of that is coming on the salary line item, um, but large areas of savings were also realized across all all areas of the budget. So we didn't just go to work on the salary side, um, all buildings and departments went to work in their respective budgets. Um, and we've, we've realized areas, all those areas noted there and items of note where we can have real savings there. Um, but I think our, our principals and department um, directors need to, need to be commended. They've done a really nice job this year in kind of working through their budget and scaling it down to truly what, what's needed. Next slide, Brooke. Um, so this just gives you a sense of building and departments where they were in the 1920 budget versus where they are in the 2021 budget. Um, so again, there's no major changes here from the April portion of the budget that we talked about. Um, the items of note give you all of the significant areas of, um, of change that happened from the 1920 budget to the 2021. Um, so again, I don't intend to walk through all those items, but at the end, if there's any questions about them, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Again, the fund transfers, um, I think it's important to note that, you know, we have nothing budgeted for the 2021 year in fund transfers. Um, so again, I just didn't feel like it was prudent to try and build in a transfer when, you know, we're looking at not transferring anything this year. But um, that is an area of longer term concern as we work through our short term issues of how do we continue to fund needed upgrades to our district facilities, to upgrades and regular maintenance to our district facilities. Next slide, Brooke. All right, so budgetary reserve, no changes have been made to this either. Um, so again, we talked about last time, the budgetary reserve really being, really specifically identifying what makes up our budgetary reserve instead of just having a flat number in there that we don't know what it means. Um, these are the real numbers that we're holding aside um, for, for placeholders. Um, I think the biggest area of risk that we're really looking at um, is what the risk is um, with charter schools and everything going on um, with COVID-19. Um, and could there be more students? Again, Act 13 held, in, held tuition and billing the same, um, you know, but are more kids moving to, to charter schools or cyber charter schools? Um, we don't know that. And we're, we're, we're all working through that. That's an area that um, my colleagues across the state um, and locally are, are talking about and figuring out what that, what that might look like next year. All right, next slide, Brooke. So we have $507,000 sitting in a budgetary reserve. And again, I, I point that out, um, you know, it was meaningful last time when we were only looking at a, a $1 million budget deficit when we looked at this in April. Um, but if, if we don't spend those items, if they don't materialize, that's an area where we will be $500,000 under budget. But it is important to set money aside there um, for true unknowns. So the next couple slides that I want to 
what I want to cover include some comparative data between Upper Dublin School District and other local school, school districts. And um, we've been asked about this um, a couple of times, and I do think it's important to start sharing some of this information um, as we gather data. Um, so the next couple of slides, the source is from uh, Forecast 5, which is a software provider that pulls in school district data from annual financial reports um, and other key data sources um, across the state. Um, and this slide that we're looking at here looks at how the school district of Upper Dublin, how our millage rate compares to other local school districts. Um, and I have a note there when you look at ours. So our millage right now is about 34.42 mils. Um, a little over three mils of that were approved by voter referendum to build the Upper Dublin High School. So um, while that's built in now, eventually that'll start to roll off um, as debt service uh, starts to be paid off in the future. Um, so again, it's there. Um, I understand taxpayers are paying for it, but if you back that out, we're at 31.4, which puts us right in the the average of where school school districts are, um, lo local school districts that we're, um, we compare ourselves to or that we're, we're nearby. Um, next slide, Brooke. So the next slide gets into assessed value by property type. Um, so I want, I want to specifically look at, actually, Brooke, can you, can you jump back to the last slide real quick? So Colonial, Upper Marion, and Wissahickon have the, lo the lowest millage rates. Um, and I point that out for a reason, just so this starts to make sense as we flip through there. Um, so I want you to look at what happens on the next slide to total assessed values for Colonial, Upper Marion, and Wissahickon. So while they're the lowest millage rates, um, when you look at now the assessed value by property type on the next slide here, you can see that their total assessed value across their, um, across their school district is the highest of all school districts. Um, and, and I think this would make sense, but you know, when you think about where property taxes come from, it comes from assessed value on properties. And again, for anyone new out there um, that may not have heard my, my talks in the past, when, when looking at property taxes, there's two different values to look at on a property. There's your market value, which is what a, essentially what a home would sell for if you put it up for sale. That's market value. Assessed value is the value of the property that um, is used to calculate taxes. So in Montgomery County, the assessed value of a home is roughly um, two times what the market value of, of the home is, or I'm sorry, 50% of what the market value of the home is. Um, so, it, so it's half. So, you know, you can see, and the one thing, the legend here, um, pink or the pink purplish color is residential assessed value. The orange is commercial assessed value. Green is industrial and then blue is agricultural. So you can see places like Upper Marion have large um, tax bases as far as commercial properties go, whereas Upper Dublin um, does not have such a large commercial base of properties. So that means more of the school district is funded by residential um, homeowners. So then that only makes sense in, uh, you know, how big is the school district? Well, naturally they might have the largest assessed value because they're the largest school district. Um, so the next slide then, Brooke, gets into breaking that down onto a apples to apples basis and compares total assessed value compared to the enrollment in the school district. And I think this is where, where it, it all comes together. So if, you, if we use example as Wissahickon and compare it to Upper Dublin. So the Wissahickon millage was 20.59 as compared to Upper Dublin of 31.4 factoring out the, the, the high school mills. The Wissahickon assessed value per student is around $800,000 versus Upper Dublin assessed value per student of $550,000. So Wissahickon does not need as high of a millage to generate the same amount of revenue per student because they have about 250,000 more of assessed value per student. Um, so then the last thing on the next slide to, to carry that um, example through, you'll see that as a further comparison, Wissahickon is operating, um, the operating expenses per student is only about $950 less than Upper Dublin. So, um, you know, they're able to have a much lower millage rate, um, but still provide about the same amount of resources per student as Upper Dublin is with, a, with the need for a higher, a higher millage. Um, and also, while you see Upper Dublin's the fourth highest of 11 districts shown on this chart, 
Um, we're only about $1,000 per student more than the district right in the middle. So um, again, on the upper side, but very much in, in the middle of, of this chart here. So Brooke, next slide. Um, major unknowns, I think we've talked about most of this um, throughout the presentation. Again, on the expenditure side, unknowns, charter school enrollment, um, we, we have no idea what assessment appeals might look like and how that, um, you know, how uh, assessment appeals that are open for properties, we have about 11 that are open for multiple years. So any assessment appeal where a property owner has a reduced assessment, before the current year that we're in actually gets booked as an expenditure. Um, and then also with COVID-19, um, there's a major unknown around what schools look like opening next year in the 2021 year. Um, what are our um, uh, protective equipment needs? Um, what are the requirements? Do we need to provide masks and other things within our buildings to, to make sure students and staff um, are, are safe returning to school in the fall? So that's a complete unknown at this point. Um, and then I think that's, that's all I have with the budget. So I'll certainly stop there. Um, so again, just to wrap it up, um, we have a lot of unknowns at this point. We've done a lot of good work on the budget. Uh, I know we have a $4 million deficit that we're, we're looking at. Um, but I, I feel like we'll work through this. Um, it won't be without some, some challenge, but we'll, we will work through this as a, a team and a district and a community. So I'll stop there and take questions. All right, so thank you, Andy. There's uh, certainly um, some, uh, some challenges ahead, but there's actually some good news buried in there as well. Um, and uh, I certainly appreciate all the hard work that's gotten us to this point. Any comments or questions on the expenditure side or really on the whole presentation? Nobody has any. Okay, in that case, um, Let's move on to the proposed final budget. Um, it looked like Mrs. Francis has her hand. Oh, she does now, yes. I'm sorry, Amy, go ahead. Sorry, I was having trouble with getting my hand raised. Um, I think it was just um, important. I have to jump off this call to get onto another, um, but I just really did not want to pass up an opportunity to thank Andy, Jen Baltasano, Steve, the team that contributed to this presentation. Um, this is really, I feel like what has been brewing and being being asked for for the years that I, since I've been on the board. And the graphics, the trends, the comparisons between uh, Upper Dublin and other uh, local municipalities and districts. Uh, Andy, I just wanted to say thank you to you and your team and to Steve as well before I, uh, before I go. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the draft resolution. Um, actually, there are other documents. You mentioned the budget narrative document in the agenda, Andy. Um, is there any, anything you wanna say before I move on about that? Just certainly, certainly encourage everyone to read it. No, the, yes, definitely read that. The only thing I would say, Mark, on the proposed final budget is um, the next agenda item are the, the draft resolutions for the June meeting. So I think we need to, just like you do for all other items, make sure the board's comfortable moving this version of the proposed budget forward um, to approval at the legislative meeting next week. Right, okay, thank you. I didn't realize, I thought those were the May ones, not the June ones, okay. So, uh, right. So I'm going to recommend that we move this forward, the budget forward as it is to the uh, legislative meeting. Normally at the May meeting, this is the time when uh, we ask board members to weigh in on where they would like or where wh what their current thinking is on the final tax increase number. Um, there's two separate questions here. One is, do we move the budget forward with a 2.6% increase? And at the same time, you can either suggest that you don't think that's appropriate or it is appropriate, or you think we wanna move it forward, but in June, we should consider something different. Is, and is anyone ready to weigh in on um, where we think we need to land in June? Nobody, nobody wants to go first. That's usually the case. Um, so I will go first. 
uh, I have said in the past that um, keeping with current trends and looking at uh, where we've been and where our neighbors have been, my starting point uh, for this year's budget uh, or this year's tax increase would be 90% of the actual index, which could be 2.34%. Given the COVID-19 impact, I'm no longer there. Um, I, my, my thought is we need to stick with the 2.6%. The unknowns are too great. We don't know what's gonna happen with the state. If I'm wrong, we have the opportunity to uh, shrink it in the future. Um, but if, I, if we shrink it now and I'm wrong, um, then we don't have the opportunity to go back up. So I think it's prudent to, to be safe. And so I'm currently recommending uh, both for the proposed final and the final, unless something happens in the next month that we land at 2.6. Uh, Darlene, I saw your hand go up first. Yes, I um, am feeling that we need to go with the 2.6 because of all the unknowns. I think there's still obviously work that needs to be done on this budget. But I think we need to allow um, everyone the opportunity to go to 2.6 if indeed it's necessary. Um, just too many unknowns for us to go lower, even though at the beginning of this budget season, you know, I was hoping to go lower. But I would support moving this forward and um, keeping it at 2.6 at this time. All right. Thanks, Darlene. Mike? I, I support staying at 2.6 and revisiting in June. Um, I, I hope that the, uh, the revenue trend, um, especially on the uh, earned income, is, uh, is a blip in April and that we see a, a stronger recovery in May. But uh, I, I, I concur with 2.6. All right. Thanks, Mike. Jeff? Yeah, I also concur on the 2.6. Um, the level of uncertainty in the world right now is just too high, um, I think, for us to, to do otherwise at this point. Um, would I be open to um, revisiting or rethinking that in June? Sure, but candidly, I'm not sure that there's going to be enough new and solid information to sway that. So, I mean, I'm definitely leaning toward the 2.6 both now and in June, but I'll leave it open, recognizing that, um, you know, the, the increase will compound problems for some that have arisen as a result of this coronavirus issue. Um, but I, I just feel we can't add to the level of the structural deficit um, by lowering it under 2.6 at this point. All right, thanks, Jeff. Jen. Um, yes, I support the, leaving the 2.6 in there and, and revisiting it in, as time goes by towards June. Um, there's just, like everyone has said, too many unknowns. We have to move forward, I think, with the 2.6. Okay, thanks. Um, Stan or Titia, do you have anything you want to add? No, okay, and I'll point out that uh, Amy, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Titia. Yeah, I, I think at this point, uh, it's prudent to stick to the 2.6. I would prefer we don't have to, but I think the reality at this point uh, doesn't allow us a lot of room, and um, I'm hoping that the May numbers will look a little more favorable than we currently fear. Okay, um, so Amy and Art have both left us to go to other meetings, uh, so they can't weigh in, but at this point, it uh, looks like we have enough to confidently say that at the legislative meeting uh, for the administration, at the legislative meeting, we'll move forward with a proposed final budget with the 2.6% um, built in. Um, all right, so do you want to review the draft budget resolutions for the June meeting? Yep, I just want to go through them them quickly. So um, as I stated, when the final budget is approved in June, it requires the approval of these, uh, these three resolutions. Um, the drafts are attached for your review to become familiar with um, and to ask questions if you, if you have any. So um, the final budget adoption resolution here 
um, it just lays out the, the basically the millage rate and increase of 2.6% and confirms the EIT and transfer tax rates. Um, so pretty straightforward um, resolution here. Um, the next resolution is the real estate tax resolution or basically the tax collection side of the resolution. Um, so it defines the collection timelines for the tax collector. Um, the re this resolution is interesting because this one could change as we discussed based on legislation that's out there. So the legislators are talking about the extension of the discount period and the elimination of the penalty period. Um, so if that changes, this may need to change. Um, one thing that, that we learned yesterday um, working with our colleagues in Montgomery County was um, the board does not have actually authority to change the periods of collection for discount and penalty. Um, but the board does have authority to make changes to the percentages. So when you look, the discount is set at 2%, which is um, pretty standard across the state. And the, the penalty is set at 10%, which is pretty standard across the state. Um, but if the legislation does nothing or the board wanted to um, say reduce the penalty um, the penalty percentage collected, um, the board would have the authority to do so. And I'll give you an example. Some school districts are talking about, um, in lieu of the legislature, um, eliminating the penalty or re reducing the penalty to 0%. Um, but if that would be something that would be decided, um, you would, th there would need to be a note in there that it would go back up as of December 31st to 10%. I would recommend it go back to um, because we have to pay fee, the school district has to pay fees for the county um, to take uh, to take control of those delinquent taxes and and collect them, even though Portnoff actually collects for us. Um, so that is an option that the board does have a, have available um, as part of this process um, to do that. Um, and then the last resolution is the Homestead Farmstead resolution. Um, this is the. Uh, the gaming monies that the state has that reduces property taxes. Um, so we actually received slightly less um, than we did last year. Um, and there's a couple more properties that are approved as, uh, as homesteads in, in Upper Dublin Township. Um, so the last year, the reduction was 300, almost $354. This year, it's $351.88 per eligible property. Um, so I'll stop there and, and see if there's any questions. Okay, thank you. The, the discretion that we have regarding the um, late penalty percentage or discount period penalty, uh, discount period uh, percentage discount, um, am I correct in remembering that we, there is a limit to how high we can go, but not how low we can go? Or is there, do we have complete discretion over that? Uh, that that was not um, that was not actually talked about, so I, I can certainly find that out. Um, but I, I know there's no limit to how how low you can go on the penalty, so it could be zero. I don't know if there's a cap on on max. Okay. Uh, any comments or questions about that item? Uh, it, teacher, go ahead. Yeah, um, the, the timeline on that decision over the late fees and all that, what is, what is that timeline? Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you ask our tax collector, it was yesterday. Um, but I, I don't think anyone's really in a position to, to make that decision. I mean, I, I would say the timeline is with, with the June board meeting um, and the passing of these resolutions. We have to have a, a clear understanding of, of where the board stands and what they want these resolutions to say at the June 22nd board meeting. And, and, and this past year, we collected about 50,000, if I remember correctly, on late fees. That's correct. Okay. Uh, if, oh, Jeff, go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Andy, if, if we reduced that to 0%, effectively, that just extends the deadline for payment of taxes. Um, would that have an impact in terms of cash flow at all? I mean, you get the direction of my question? Yeah, I absolutely understand your question. It's a great question. Um, I would probably say the answer on the penalty side is no. Um, I think the, the, the bigger impact would be on the discount period side because so much of the revenue comes in at the discount period. 
if the legislature push, pushed that back to the end of September, as an example, and we didn't get you know, a large portion of that till the end of September, that there's potential for that to create issues. But I don't think on the penalty side, um, we'd have cash flow issues. You know, if you were concerned about that, you can always hedge by making it, you know, 1% or something, just to give some little incentive to not waiting till the last minute. But because um, so, I agree that effectively just changes the last minute to make it zero. So, so Mark, if I can jump in real quick, our, uh, our tax collector must be listening in. Um, he, he just sent me a text that said, by law, penalty cannot be more than 10% and discount must be a minimum of 2%. Thank you, Mike Klein. Yep. Yeah, he is. Uh, he is listening in. Thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, so, um, do we? Uh, anyone else want to discuss? I mean, is there other information we can ask the administration to provide us to help us with this decision in June? What What do we need to know? Um, I guess one of the things I think I need to know is what other districts are planning to do. Um, uh, we know the $50,000 impact. Uh, Jeff asked a good question about uh, cash flow impact. Um, any, other, any other information we, we would want them to provide for next month to make this decision? Mr. Sirota, if I could just chime in, we'll have a better idea of enrollment next uh, month as well. Uh, particularly kindergarten enrollment. It won't be a final look at enrollment, uh, but that will also uh, help us refine some of the staffing pieces. Yeah, good point. Thank you. All right, so I think what we'll do is let's take this up as an item to discuss uh, at the next finance committee meeting. Um, and, uh, and, and so we can all be uh, more prepared to consider the, the pros and cons and make a final decision. Uh, and Mr. Sirota, I'm, if I might, I, I'll say one more thing. This decision may be made for the board if the if the state passes legislation around this. So um, we'll certainly know more. Yeah. We should right. hopefully know more by by June. Yeah, that's a fair point. And uh, Mike Klein, I, I apologize for punting to next month, <laughs> but I think it's what we need to do. Um, so um, Next item on the agenda, there's no action we need to take on that one. Next one is the property tax rebate program update. Yeah, so at the, at the last meeting, um, at the finance committee meeting, we reviewed um, the property tax rebate program. I got some information from North Penn uh, presented that. What I have for you tonight, um, one of the takeaways from that meeting, um, the committee asked if, we, if I could gather up more information from North Penn about what the the actual um, usage of the program was by eligible um, eligible property owners and, and renters. Um, and what North Penn said is um, they've been budgeting about 50% of the potential cost of the program, um, but the re reality is the actual has been much closer to 25%. Um, so uh, th they did say, obviously, it's unknown, you know, with the current financial crisis, may more people take advantage of that, it's possible. Um, but but they budget, they've historically, the last two years, seen about 25%, um, and they budget at 50. So if we went with the 40% rebate, as an example, if the board approved this, um, we would need to budget for about $37,000 of, of expense um, to implement this program. All right, any comments or questions on that item? Uh, to clarify, Andy, uh, our, we thought we needed to make a decision on this um, really this, this month in order to fully implement by July, uh, assuming that that's still the date when people need to pay their taxes. Um, uh, do we, uh, is that still the case? I don't think so. I mean, I think because the this program can actually be um, the way if you looked at the resolution, I did include a draft resolution and, and the forms that, that um, they use in North Penn. Um, they allow uh, eligible property owners to submit for rebates throughout the entire year. So I think ideally we would want to approve it now so we could get a letter in with the tax bill. Um, but I don't know under the circumstances if we need another month to make this decision that that um, that that would be a huge issue. 
That's right. It was driven by getting a letter into the tax bill. Yep. Um, Jen, I see you had your hand up. Yes. Can we cap it at all? Like just set aside a certain amount of funds and say, this is what the amount we have for this program. I don't see how we could cap it to like the first 30 people that submit it. Um, so I don't think, I think that would be really hard to manage. I think if you want to, if you want to cap it, then, you know, the, I think the factors that are available to change would be the, how much of a rebate do we want to give in order to manage the cost. So if we think 74,000 as a maximum or 37,000 is too much, then you, we could reduce the percentage rebate to drive that number down. Um, and then increase it in the future if, if need to, or, or decrease it in the future. Stan? Yeah, hey Andy, how many uh, school districts in Montgomery County have this uh, program in place? I'm only aware of one, North Penn. I know, I, I remember hearing that others uh, have been considering it. Uh, I'm also only aware of that one though. Yes, um, in our in our meetings, our regular meetings with superintendents, there are two or three others that are um, exploring this. I would say that we are further ahead in our exploration than some of those other districts, but it's just North Penn. Any other comments or questions? Uh, both of you still have your hand up. Did you, Jen? Did you have something else? No. Um, so I have, uh, I personally have mixed feelings about the idea. Um, I think giving a little bit of help to the people who most need it is, uh, for really a relatively low cost, uh, seems like a good idea. On the other hand, we're basically duplicating exactly what the state is doing. We're basically saying the state's not doing enough. We're going to do more. Um, and, um, and normally when we think the state isn't doing enough um our approach is to petition the legislature to do something different or more um and that you know i in the past we have some of us have um recommended to our legislature that they consider ideas uh like beefing up that program uh, expanding the eligibility or expanding the amount that they provide um that's to my knowledge never gotten any traction in the state legislature um so uh you know i think thirty seven thousand dollars is a likely amount i mean i think that's probably the number you put in the budget for it um given that the actual for north pan was 25 percent um so putting in a 50 percent number looks pretty comfortable um it that's a, a fairly cheap program to help our neediest um people uh does anyone else uh, ready to, to express an opinion on it or do you need to wait another month? What would waiting, what, in, what additional information would an, another month give you that would help solidify the decision? Uh, Jeff. Mark, Mark I'm ready. Um, now, I, I can't think of any other information I personally would need. Um, I, I'd be in favor of passing this. Um, I think your commentary and analysis was was very on point. Um, I just don't think on balance this is one where I would put it in the petition, the legislature column, as opposed to us uh, grabbing the bull by the horns at the local level. So I'd be in favor of moving this forward at this time. Okay, thanks, Titia. Yeah, I would agree um, with Jeff that uh, for the amount that is involved, I think it is the, the, the right thing to do. Okay, Darlene? I too am in support of moving it forward, um, particularly in the climate that we're in right now. For those that are struggling, they're probably really struggling at this point, and to provide you know, this support, which is minimal, uh, to the district um, in terms of cost, I think is um, the best thing for us to do. Mike. I concur with uh, moving forward with uh, the decision. Okay, so um, the other thing I'll point out 
uh, as I think this through, I'm sort of thinking out loud here, is that um, this is this is a form of tax shifting. I mean, all almost all taxation is a form of tax shifting. We're basically pinning this 37-ish thousand dollars. Um, we're taking it away from our neediest people and asking the rest of our community um, to foot that bill. We're not reducing $37,000 of expenditures. Um, so we have to make that up um, effectively in fund balance or, um, you know, that it, it, in a time when we're concerned about the future uh, to give up $37,000 of revenue, it is not a big number, but it's still giving up revenue. Um, uh, I, uh, and, and it is, you know, a program that already exists. Um, it's not, you know, brand new. I, I don't know. So I, I only heard one of our uh, committee members weigh in, which was Mike. Um, we do need to move it out of committee in order to get it to the legislative meeting. Um, so Stan or Amy? No, oh, Amy is oh. Stan, do you have an opinion? Uh, no, I, I, since um, we're probably going to go with the 2.6, I think we should just move this, uh, this program along. Okay, so in that case, I'm going to recommend we move this out of committee to the legislative meeting. We've got three of us uh, in agreement, and so we'll have a, a full vote on it uh, at the legislative meeting. Next up, the natural gas rate lock. Yes, so this is uh, this is a request for a ratification of an agreement that was approved on May 7, 2020. Um, so we work with a consultant for the procurement of both electric and natural gas, as do most school districts. Um, it's a, a company that uh, the district's been working with for some time, I think going back to 2014, um, Amorex Energy Services. Um, and I gotta tell you, I've been really happy with the services that they've provided, uh, they provide to us. So they've been talking with us since the beginning of March um, about looking at natural gas and elect electric. Um, they came in and met with uh, Bob Lester and myself to introduce themselves. It was the first time I had a chance to meet with them um, and, and we've been in communication ever since. Um, so pricing was currently, um, natural gas pricing was currently locked through June 21st or through June 2021, 20, uh, um, but they were already closely watching the markets as a result of the early trends of COVID-19. Um, so on May 1st, they reached back out to us about seriously considering locking for an extended period of time due to um, the uncertainty of the oil markets and the historically low pricing. Um, so natural gas, um, and I've learned quite a bit about natural gas in the, the last couple of weeks, but natural gas is essentially a byproduct of oil production. Um, and with oil demand down significantly, there's a concern that natural gas production could decline as well, um, causing increases in future prices. So um, even if that is not the case, even if that doesn't happen, what, we're, what we locked for was 3.426 per decatherm, which is the lowest price that we've, been, that we've locked going back to 2013. Um, so while that, that's not the lowest price that you'll find for natu natural gas, um, as a school district, um, most of our consumption happens in the winter time and we don't really have much control over that, right? We have students and staff in buildings and it's cold and we need to, we need to heat the building. So um, natural gas tends to be more expensive during those, those months, but it's the lowest we've ever locked at. Um, we're not, also not in a position to take significant risks. As we talked about tonight, we have a, a budget challenge that we're facing. So gambling with the price of commodities just didn't seem like something um, that I thought was, was in our best interest. So in discussions with uh, Bob Lester, we felt it was the most advantageous decision um, to take that risk off the table, lock in a, a price that's been lower than we blocked before um, and lock that in for 30 months. So, um, so I know it's, it's already, we're, we're just ratifying this, um, but you know, I, I feel pretty good about, about where we're at with natural gas. So any questions about that? That sounds like good news to me. Any comments or questions, uh, Stan? Yes, Andy, is there any uh, fee uh, involved with uh, locking it in there for the next two, you know, for the next couple of years? I mean, there's no, there's no fee for locking in that. That's typically what you would do with commodities. So we, you know, we pay Amorex uh, a, a fee for their services, um, but there's no, there's no fee to lock for, you know, there's no more fee to lock for 30 months than there would be for 12. So we're, we're just paying for their, their services. 
Yeah, the reason why I'm saying that, like for me to get propane, I can lock it in at a certain rate and it costs me like $125 annually. So that was my, that was the reason why I asked that question. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right, anyone not okay with moving that forward to the legislative meeting? Okay, so we'll move that one forward. Last up, uh, approving the contract with Sweet Stevens. Yep, and, and this is just an annual agreement that we have with, um, with our solicitor, Sweet Stevens, Katz and Williams. They do our special ed um, law, our special ed legal work for us. So this is just an update of their rates, which are unchanged from the, the current year. Last year, we made the change from Whistler Pearlstein to Sweet Stevens for special ed counsel, and we said we would uh, evaluate and reevaluate services throughout the year. We've been exceedingly pleased um, with the counsel that we've received from Sweet Stevens, uh, namely Tom Warner, um, and we're um, able to uh, rectify some of the issues that we've had in the past. So um, we would be very appreciative for the board to move this forward. All right, comments or questions? All right, anyone on the committee not okay with moving that forward? All right, we'll move that one forward. And we are up to community input. So the way this works is uh, if you are a member of the community and you're listening in and you would like to speak, please raise your hand. Uh, and I will call on you uh, in turn and our usual um, four minute time limit applies. And if, uh, if when you start speaking, please introduce yourself and tell us where in the community you are from. Uh, before I do that, we also provide, because not everyone has uh, the means to give input during the meeting, we also provide the opportunity for people to send comments in. Uh, I have one, are there any others, Mr. Lechman or Dr. Yanni? No, I, I think one is all we have. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read that input um, from one of our community members. And after that, I will move on to those people who are raising their hands. Uh, this is from Anita Brister from Fort Washington. Uh, she has four points. Number one, administrator salaries. Are administrators getting a pay increase? In the original proposed budget, there was a placeholder of 3% for pay increases. In light of current circumstances, that does not seem affordable to me. Are administrators getting pay increases? And if so, what is the percentage increase? I'm asking about those, both those in the Act 93 group and those not in the Act 93 group. Number two, spring extracurricular uh, salaries. I'm very disturbed that taxpayers having to, I'm very disturbed by the taxpayers having to pay salaries for spring extracurricular activities. In April, the board voted unanimously to pay 145,800 in salaries for sports, theater, et cetera. These are activities that cannot happen at all. There was no discussion or comment from any board member. I understand that the state legislature, man, state legislature mandated that teachers be paid normally as if there were no pandemic and a lockdown, which is creating huge unemployment. In my opinion, the teachers receiving this additional salary for activities that are not happening should do a voluntary give back of the $145,800. $145, Number three, staffing for next year. I see that we have 10 retirements and an overall reduction of 13 staff. I'm very glad to see a savings of 1.4 million in total compensation. Could Dr. Yanni provide more information on the staffing changes for next year? Is this a mix of both teaching staff and administrative staff? Number four, the tax increase. Just a comment, not a question. A 2.6% increase in the middle of a pandemic is a hardship for many taxpayers. Please remember that Upper Dublin has had the highest 10 year tax increase of all 60 suburban districts two years in a row. Please try to find enough savings to reduce the tax increase so it is below 2%. Thank you to Dr. Yanni and Mr. Lechman, who I'm sure have spent countless hours finding considerable savings since next year's budget was first proposed. All right, thank you, Mrs. Brister. And uh, let's move on. Next up, um, Mrs. Kuznets, you should be able to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm surprised I haven't heard anyone on the board bring this up given our financial situation and looking at the slides that our biggest expenditure is teacher salary. And then Anita kind of brought some of it up today about you know the extra the spring extracurricular activities. So I guess my question are, 
my question is, have the teachers union been approached for some sort of give back or raise or freeze and step or something to help us with this financial situation? Um, and, and I specifically want to know if the, a yes or no, if they've been approached um, with some of these options. Um, and then one of the things Anita also brought up, brought up is it seems, it, it also seems weird to me, the lack of discussion um, about certain things. It just feels like things have been discussed behind the scenes. Um, and then everyone's just kind of listening to the presentation. Um, so, you know, I, I just think it's a little bit concerning, especially when we talk about, you know, having 10 staff retire and we're only replacing three of them. I just thought that would have at least elicited questions as to who are we replacing and who are we not replacing? And if we're not replacing them, why are we not replacing them? I just find it a little bit um, unnerving. And then my last question is, uh, you know, when we talk about like the rebate um, give back situation, I think it's great that we're gonna try to help those most in need. I know that the township has also a one-time kind of um, fund for residents who struggle. And I didn't know if maybe the district, if this give back or this um, tax break or whatever we want to call it, the rebate program doesn't necessarily work out or it's too expensive. Maybe we could move to something um, of that nature where there's X amount of dollars per person, you know, if they apply for help or something like that. It's just something that I thought was interesting um, that the township does. I guess that's it. Okay, thank you. Um... And uh, I see no other hands, just one last chance. If anyone would like to speak, please raise your hand in the chat. I mean, not in the chat, in the, uh, in the Zoom call. All right, seeing nobody else, uh, I will close community input. And um, Dr. Yanni, any comments uh, on any of that? Sure, I'll start. Um, in terms of Act 93, the administrators that are part of that group and the administrators that are not part of that group, um, we're finishing into the year evaluations. Um, at this point in time, there will be increases. Uh, the increases will not be anywhere near 3%. Um, we're being uh, judicious um, given the uh, state of the economy and also uh, the available funds we have in the district. So um, we will not be um, anywhere near 3%. In terms of uh, retirements, the retirements are a combination of both teachers and administrators. And the reason why we're only uh, replacing uh, a small number is because we're actually doing something called right sizing. So um, at the high school, for example, if a department had 10 people in it, no matter what the tallies were, no matter what the course requests were, full schedules were given to um, you know, 10, 10 teachers. So we looked at where we have retirements and we looked at course enrollments and tallies through the course selection process. And we said, do we actually need all of those folks or can we either reroute that position somewhere else or uh, reroute some of those funds somewhere else? So um, in the communication that I sent out earlier this week, despite not uh, replacing some of our retirees, we are not seeing uh, increased class sizes. So K-1-2s, 22, 3, 4, 5, 24, I can tell you the, uh, the look at um, class sizes at elementary were not, were not touching um, those numbers yet. Um, and we've kept a buffer in to account for new enrollments over the summer. Same thing six through 12. Uh, we have not scheduled any class even close to the class size max so that we can um, have that buffer as we receive more enrollment over the summer. Um, there'll be um, two fewer administrative positions next year. Um, the, the teaching positions, we had a science teacher uh, retire, an English teacher retire, um, and a few other retirements. Um, but again, we looked at um, making sure that our staffing matches our enrollment and our student needs to make sure that we are, number one, staffing appropriately, but also um, being as appropriate as we can um, with, with school district finances. So 
Um, at this point, I'm very comfortable uh, with the staffing level where we'll be um, for next year. Of course, it may change a little bit. Um, kindergarten numbers are lagging a little bit. I'm sure as we move in uh, through the next month that uh, those will pick up as well. Um, in terms of the, uh, the extracurricular pay, um, as one of our community members noted, that was a result of legislation. Uh, when the legislation was signed, um, giving or directing and requiring school districts to pay all school employees as they normally would be, I don't believe that the, legislator, the legislature really understood that that meant when, when the word all was put in, that all really meant all. So not just administrators, teachers, support staff, but even all the extracurriculars. So um, we'll be um, discussing what that looks like uh, in the fall with our associations. Mr. Sorota, did I miss any? Um... Uh, the only thing I wanted to add to that, there were uh, comments from each about um, a lack of questions from the board on uh, a couple of those things, uh, specifically around uh, staffing and, and that sort of thing. And I just want to remind everyone that, um, yes, uh, staffing issues, personnel issues are handled in executive session. So uh, the board has uh, discussed and asked questions of the administration um, during executive sessions, but those meetings are naturally not public because they're discussing personnel. And I would just like to say along, along the lines of class size and programs for kids, you know, I'm very sensitive to the class size issue, um, especially um, as a former elementary teacher and primary teacher. So one thing that uh, folks can be assured of as we look to next year, that we are keeping a very close eye uh, on, on class sizes so that they, so that we maintain good class sizes so our kids can get um, not only good um, core instruction, but intervention services um, and enrichment services that they need. I'll also just take this opportunity to echo uh, one of the comments. Uh, it's already been said by uh, Ms. Francek earlier, but thank you very much to Dr. Yanni uh, and Mr. Lechman and everyone else who is involved uh, in con finding considerable savings uh, from the preliminary budget back in January. Um, so on the expense side, we've done uh, very well this year. Um, it's a shame that the revenue side is uh, looking a little uglier than anticipated, but um, we will make the best of it. All right, any final Mr. comments? There's one more uh, oh, point that we didn't address, the, yep. the um, question about uh, give backs from the associations. And what I'll say is there has been ongoing collaboration uh, with UDEA and UDESPA about what staffing looks like for next year and uh, a myriad of those issues. Okay, thanks. Uh, Stan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just want to add this right sizing has been going, discussions have been going on for months. And uh, believe me, this wasn't the final uh, outcome. I mean, there's different, different scenarios that we went over. It's just that this seems like the, the most reasonable one that, one that came out of, of all those discussions. All right, any final comments from the committee, from the rest of the board, from the administration, Titia? Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Amy said earlier that the the clarity of the presentation and the, the information that's available to the board on this has been uh, very, very helpful and much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right, our uh, next finance committee meeting will be Wednesday, June 17th at 6 p.m. right here on Zoom, I presume. Uh, and we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.